Um, when there, when there are something that in your music that are beyond what notes can show and the markings can show, um, so there's a deeper, deeper intention. Do you put that in your intro, or do you just leave it to the conductor to figure it out? No, I mean, I, but I put a lot of things. Actually, I have big preface notes. I put a lot of things, but that's just surface things. I I feel that the the things you're talking about are the conductor's responsibility. <coughs> I don't want the conductor to to hear my music with my ears. I want a conductor and a performer, whoever's interpreting my music, to hear my music with their ears. So I don't put these things I'm talking about in the preface, no. I just, everywhere I go, I talk about the importance of this, that the conductor has to do this. It's a conductor's, it's a, it's a huge privilege actually for a conductor. It's a huge privilege and a huge responsibility because you're the care, as a conductor, you're the caretakers of the music, not the, comp the composer. We give it up. It's like children that have gone out the door. They're out there, and, and we've given up our control. We don't have any any uh, control of them anymore. And some of them do well, and I love them all, and some of them wind up in prison. But it's, <laughs> and it's, it's, the, it's the performers and the interpreters that shape the life of that music. And that's a huge privilege. You shape the destiny of the music you love. It's a privilege and it's a responsibility that you all have, individually and as a large and in the larger sense as well as a group. Yes, um, a student asked me a question a couple of days ago, and he was curious if a composer could, could compose a piece of music devoid of programmatic content and emotion. <laughs> well, programmatic content, sure. There's, there's a whole history of music that's not programmatic. Sonata number 26. That's, that's it. That's all we know. Um, and there's a big argument about whether music can, can be devoid of expression. I personally believe that's impossible. And uh, Stravinsky used to talk about that. Music's incapable of expressing anything but itself, he said. But that's such a crock. He, there's no way he really believed that. Because he was, he was, his, music, his music was constantly expressive. And Stravinsky was always trying to just make people raise eyebrows and make them catch them off guard. I, I just think you can't escape it. It's a human creation. It comes from human beings sharing it with their fellow human beings. And it can't help it but express something. I mean, it really, you can also get right down to a visceral level. There's something else Stravinsky said. He says music sings and it dances. And that's it. All music. When you get right down to it, it's singing and or dancing. If it's not doing one of those two, it's probably not working. But then it's how do we define what dance is? I mean, dance can be straight ahead Michael Jackson dance, or it can be, yeah, this thing in 13-8 is dancing. You know, with, the, with the hiccups and everything, that's a cool dance. And, and singing. Some people would say that, uh, I don't know. sing to me. But for another composer, they'll make that sing. I just did a 12-tone row right there. And some composers can make that really sing. In fact, I can replay that and make that 12-tone row really sing. So, so the def definition of what singing and dancing is can be pretty broad. But when you get right down to it, that's what music does. It sings or it dances. And it's, if, it's, if it's music, it's about something. Can you put that in words? Not always. But even Sonata 26, is expressing something very powerful, in some ways something more powerful than words can express. In fact, if we if we could come up with the words to express Sonata Number 26, then we wouldn't need to compose Sonata Number 26. We could just talk about it and get the same fulfillment. But we can't. We can't find the words it's because Sonata 26, as music, it takes us to a place that actually transcends words. In a way, it's an even more powerful place, expressively, than words can go to. And, I, and that makes, see, I can't come up with words to even explain this, but you know what I'm talking about. It, it takes you to a place that words can't touch, put it that way. Maybe on that I should quit talking then. <laughs> <laughs> Any final? Yes, yeah. Um, if you look back at the obvious, you think it's sound. 
Um, you're talking about style, the composer's yeah. voice. And yeah. Sure, I think I do. Um, again, I don't like to describe it in words, but what we are as, as composers, and, and all of us, we are creatures of habit. When you get in back to the millions of little black dots, if you write millions of black dots over a long period of time, I guarantee you there are going to be certain habits that happen. Certain black dots are going to tend to go to certain other black dots. It just happens. And out of that, a style crystallizes. It just gradually crystallizes into a voice. When I was young, I, I remember saying to my teacher, Leslie Bassett, that I don't feel like I have a voice yet. And he just he said to me, young man, you don't find your voice. Your voice finds you. And that meant nothing to me at the time. But boy, do I get it now. You don't find it. If you go try to find your voice, you're going to fail. It will find you over time. I came in late, maybe you've discussed this. And don't Bob, I know you? We've met a couple of times. I years. thought so, yeah. <laughs> I know Bob Rand. He's an old oh, old that's how I know you, yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering what your uh, favorite work for wind band is. Uh, either one of your pieces or another composer's. I was wondering, and, and why? Yeah, I can never. It's the same as my favorite composer. And my own, and of my own pieces, I never can answer that. Again, it's, they're like children. I even like some of those pieces that are in prison that I just mentioned um, a lot. And I love them. So it's hard. It's like children. It's hard to pick which child you love more than the most of your children. So I always, now, conducting, I really love. I just did Angels. I love conduct, conducting that piece. It's, a, it's just like this huge ego trip when that climax comes out. So it's, just, it's fun. And I love conducting Angels. I love conducting cliches, so there are certain pieces I like to conduct a lot, but I don't, that doesn't mean I love them more than others of my pieces. And there's, there's certainly no one band piece I love more than others. There are just too many good ones out there, I think. It's pretty exciting. There's more and more good ones coming. What I do love to do is go and hear the newest stuff that's out there. That's why I love CBDNA. The next conference is in, in Seattle uh, in March. Ed's going as well. You're going, right? Yeah. And any, anybody else here going to CBDNA? It's the college. It's in Seattle, and basically, it's just a new music festival. It's almost all new music, and I love it because I get to hear everything that's brand new, the good and the stuff that I'll never want to hear again. That's okay. I'll put up with it because I'm going to hear something that I really fall in love with, and so it's worth it always for me to go to go to those things when I can. So, yeah, no one piece though. Now, following up on that question, I was wondering, what attribute, attribute, attributes excuse me, do you think uh, make a piece maybe stand the test of time? Uh, it's I, What I said earlier, was, I was talking about sincerity and, and genuineness. It just, has, it, it just has to have that. It's just, it, it has to be real. There can't be an insincerity behind it. It can't be driven by money. It can't be compromised by the deadline. It can't be compromised by ego. You can't write a piece because you want it to be the best thing in the world and you want it to win the Pulitzer Prize. None of those things will work. It's got to be because this is what I want to express. I'm trying to do the best I can to express this. And if a piece has that, it has that genuineness thing. Um, I wish I could come up with another word because genuine is such a cliche word. But there's, a, there's just a certain integrity and a dignity to the piece that has to be there. And, and along with that, there's a sense that every note that's there had to be there. I've written about this on, on occasion. I mean, if you take the whole suite, that first movement, the chacon, imagine, I don't know how many variations it has. It's, you know, it's a certain number of variations. It's just a ground variation piece. Take away one variation. Would the piece be as good? Of course not. Add one variation. Add, make it one variation longer. I don't think so. Imagine the piece having some one note changed. Imagine it being something other than that final last chord. It's scored exactly as it's scored. You know, with that big, high, bright E flat major chord at the end with a cymbal crash, and, and you just cut that off. Imagine something, imagine that big chord, bah, bah, and a bass drum at the end, or just anything. And something's going to suffer in that piece.